uh, just introducing folks to some of the concepts we're thinking about, uh, introducing folks to how to think adversarially about defense. Uh, I'm going to talk about where kind of we can bridge the mindset gap and uh, strengthen our defense with more of uh, a mindset change than necessarily technical change and how technical uh, controls we bring to the table can augment that. Uh, so just excuse me once. Yeah, I think I was having some trouble with my audio. I think we should be good now. All right. Yeah, we, so, can, yeah, we can hear you great. Kush, yeah. All right. Let me just uh, get my screen sharing going then. And yep, there we go. Uh, all right, so just uh, before I get into the nitty gritty, a bit of background about Smokescreen. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is something that comes from um, an, a perspective informed by Smokescreen's uh, work on Red Team and Blue Team with multiple organizations, uh, including myself, but also the rest of the team, where we've had folks on the team that have engaged with, uh, you know, Fortune 50s even and broken in despite the millions of dollars of technology. Uh, you can break in without getting detected. So why is that? That's something I'm going to talk about. A lot of these ideas are not just something that you know you've picked up from shelf in the uh, from a, from the bookshelf. It's uh, something that we've actually tried and tested. Uh, so that's basically what I'm going to be covering today. I'm going to be covering adversarial thinking, which, uh, in our opinion, is how you can really step up your security game on the defenses. So if you look at the image on the right, uh, most people generally, you know, they see a bunch of rocks. Uh, I'm going to give you like maybe a few seconds to see if you spot anything unusual about that image, anything that jumps out at you, anything that, you know, looks a little out of place. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you might have spotted the sniper on the upper right. That's basically what we, what we seek to do with adversarial thinking. We want to make the environment hostile to an adversary, but to somebody who's just going about their day-to-day, -day, it should not really affect them. Uh, we do that with deception, but our whole approach that I'm going to talk about here is not just uh, tied into smoke screens technology. It's about how you can use various approaches, tie them together to make defensive security as a whole much stronger. Like uh, Mervin was talking about before, where at the end of the day, we have a common goal where we want to prevent breaches. Uh, so let's play a little game before we get started, right? Uh, let's imagine you're an attacker. I'm going to put you in the attacker's shoes. The pot of gold on the upper left that you see, that's your target. That's what you want to go for. Uh, then let's say that that's you as the attacker on the bottom left. I've got, uh, you know, all my traditional defenses that I'm supposed to have. I've got my firewalls. I've got my IDSs, IPSs. I've got a SOC team. Now that leaves you with a certain number of attack parts, uh, most of which are ruled out because of the defenses I have in place. However, once again, if you give it just a few seconds of thought, you're probably already going to have found a way to the pot of gold, right? Now, to those of you who were thinking about how to achieve this, and even to those of you who actually did manage to spot that path, that's it. Adversarial thinking, you've actually managed to exercise it. So it's actually that simple. What actually underlies this though? Notice that you didn't think about uh, how to defend. You thought more about how to attack, how to get to your goal. And then if you want to defend, you've got to figure out ways to uh, prevent the attacker from achieving their goal uh, successfully. So that's basically the difference. Uh, one of the key differences between defenders and attackers is defenders tend to think in lists where, you know, we say that, okay, I've got strong passwords. I've got my 2FA. I've got uh, my firewall. Uh, and I've got all the stuff I'm supposed to have. Whereas attackers, they kind of tend to think in graphs. They'll tend to think more about uh, what, what are the gaps that are available. You can say that you have all the stuff on the left, but that could still leave, like we saw in the game earlier, like we see on this uh, graph here, that could still leave one attack path that is still available despite all the layers being covered. So that essentially results in these kinds of attacks, right? On the uh, enterprise side, you've got someone like Target where... Uh, You've got really good tech deployed. They had FireEyes tech deployed, quite capable tech, it even detected the attacks, right? But uh, one of the things that was missing in the checklist was whether every alert is actually being monitored. And at sometimes uh, that's just not feasible at the scale of larger enterprises. It's just not feasible. On the other hand, uh, in terms of personal experiences, 
uh, the story on the right is something I would really recommend reading. It actually makes for a, a good, uh, quick read on, over the weekend, where uh, uh, this writer, he had a really valuable Twitter handle. Somebody wanted it. And despite him having all sorts of uh, security controls on his various accounts, the attackers found one set of uh, steps that despite these controls, there were certain gaps that were left in the steps and they could exploit those steps to get controls, uh, control of his uh, various accounts, including the one that they actually wanted, which is his Twitter handle. So to talk about uh, why this is successful, it's important to understand something called the OODA loop. Now, the OODA loop was created as a concept by a World War II fighter pilot. It was developed for the domain of aerial combat, but it kind of applies to pretty much any, uh, any adversarial face-off where two sides have differing goals, whether it's uh, cyberspace, whether it's aerial combat, or whether it's even business negotiations and interpersonal relationships. You know, you want to go out for dinner to some place, your friends want to go elsewhere, whoever can complete this loop first gets their way. So uh, UDA essentially stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. And when you're able to uh, complete these, uh, whoever completes this loop first defeats their uh, opponent. Now think about it from an attacker's perspective. They've got to break into an organization. Once they've broken in, they need to observe the environment. They need to figure out where in the network they are, what are the network assets around them, what are the user they are logged in as, what privileges does that, does that user have, and so on. Basically, this is something that uh, you might have heard called situational awareness. Now, if you have that, that's a good baseline to start with. Then you figure out, I have various uh, goals I can orient myself towards. I can orient myself towards either uh, say your domain controller or an application database or some sensitive files you have on some uh, C-level executive's laptop or maybe the IT admin's password list. Uh, my goals could be all over the place. Depending on what my goal is, I orient myself towards one of the available targets. Once I've oriented myself towards a target, I have a multitude of uh, approaches available. Let's say I decide to go after your domain controller. If I'm choosing to go after your domain controller, do I just go there directly from the machine I have? Do I you know, uh, pop up something that forces an admin to come and dismiss an alert? Once the admin has put their, uh, typed in their password to validate something with Windows, their passwords are now in memory and then I can dump it from there. Or do I try to actually pivot across the network to the IT segment, find an admin there and compromise their machine? Or you know, do I just go for gold and try something like cover roasting? Those are various approaches available to me. So I need to decide one of those approaches. And then finally, acting is where I execute my attack. Defenders, on the other hand, also have to go to the same loop, but we've kind of got a disadvantage here, where when the attacker's acting, when the attacker's in this final quadrant, that's when we start observing. We start observing that there's an attack happening in our environment. And once we've observed, we see where the attacker is, right? I'm getting logs from my domain control. I'm getting logs from an IT admin's machine. I'm getting logs even from the machines of an HR of some HR interns who probably clicked on some link that they weren't supposed to click on. So these are various places I can uh, begin my defense. Where, where do I actually want to put my defend, defensive controls in place first? These are the various options I have. Let's say I orient myself towards the initial machines, those HR interns that uh, the, the command and control channel exists through. If I can do that, then I can essentially cut off the attacker's access across the rest of the network. Um, I've oriented myself towards that goal. Now I've got various ways to exercise those controls. I can cut them off the network using network access controls. I can change firewall rules where they are allowed to talk within the same little subnet, but not across uh, subnets. Or I could terminate user sessions. I could maybe change something on the proxy to disallow certain connections. After I've decided which of these approaches or which of these combinations of approaches I want to take, then I finally execute those. But obviously, as I said, if the attacker is starting their action and that's when we are observing them, we are obviously way behind. And attackers, uh, attackers are usually executing the attacks through scripts. So you know that's not really something a human can compete with in terms of speed. So we've got to do two things if we want to complete this loop first. One, we've got to speed ourselves up. Um, if you're starting so late, we definitely need to go faster on all the steps we're taking. That's where, you, uh, that's where all your orchestration comes in. That's where you can use something like NIFT's uh, SOAR uh, platform and have your various solutions take certain actions automatically. For example, if you've got certain types of attacks, let's say you've got uh, known malware, uh, something like WannaCry, for example, is something we see uh, surprisingly even today in a lot of large enterprises. Now, it's, while it is surprising given time that you know it's been about two and a half years since the patch was released, 
uh, when you look at the operational logistics, it's not really that surprising because there's actually a lot of uh, ground to cover for any security team. Now, for that, we know how to respond to it. So we can essentially orchestrate something where uh, when I get that alert, that tells me that, you know, that patch is not applied, MS17010. It tells me that SMB version 1 is still enabled in, in my environment, with, which Microsoft recommends disabling. It, uh, it also tells me that maybe my network segmentation isn't so great, right? I found certain weaknesses in my network segmentation. And I'd usually have a team member respond to that accordingly. Now, if I've got uh, this knowledge ahead of time, that I know when I get this detection, this is what I'm going to do. Why is a human even involved in the picture? We could just automate this and spend the human's time and attention on something that actually warrants it. So that's where our, a lot of orchestration can help speed us up on the loop. And uh, if we can slow down the attacker, then we can also you know, gain a competitive advantage. The way we do that is, the way we do it is through deception, where we create a bunch of decoy assets, uh, which I'll show you in just a few moments how that works. Uh, the attacker is not quite sure which one they should engage with. If they engage with the wrong one, they go through and they attack the wrong uh, uh, network asset or you know asset on the endpoint. And once, let's say they even discover that it is a decoy asset, that means they still have to go back, orient themselves towards a different uh, goal and then decide on the approaches and then act again. So we slowed them down by essentially forcing them to reset a part of their loop. That allows us with the combination of speeding up through orchestration, that allows us to really counter them much more effectively. So what is adversarial thinking? You can essentially think of it as a combination of a few, uh, a few approaches. One is red teaming. Now, anybody uh, in the security industry worth their sort will tell you, you know, it's, it's not just enough to think as a defender. You have to occasionally actually test out your assumptions, see whether, that, whether they work. Red teaming is one really effective way to do that. Another one, obviously kind of a little pet project of ours is deception. Um, you can combine the two of these along with the defensive approaches uh, to go into threat hunting, uh, where you start looking for threats proactively as, a, as opposed to just waiting the SOC for the alerts to come to you. And finally, incident response, where we, we talk about how we really want to uh, automate as much as we can, but there will be some things that require human attention and how do we strategize a response to that. So just before we dive into deception, let's look at how we can make uh, the attacker's life difficult with uh, threat hunting because red teaming and incident response is something pretty much anyone in the security industry today is familiar with. Even threat hunting, most folks are familiar with, but just let's uh, take a quick walk through the concept. Uh, now, back to the same old game from earlier. We've got uh, you at the bottom, we've got the part of gold at the top, we've got uh, you know my soft team and my defenses. Now, instead of my defenses being static as they were before, my threat hunting team could pretty much appear at any point on the entire enterprise uh, infrastructure. So you can't be confident that if you found certain weaknesses, then you know that you, know, you can get past because the threat hunting team could detect that activity at any point. So this makes your life a lot more difficult. And this of course works in conjunction with all your traditional controls like your IDSs, IPSs and uh, sandboxes and so on. But let's, let's step it up even further. Let's actually set up some deception for the attacker where if, if the pot of gold is what you need to target, let's set up various pots of gold. As the attacker, this kind of leaves you in, uh, in a sense of confusion where what do you go after first? Imagine if each of these had some sort of motion sensor and light detectors uh, on them that would notify the SOC team as soon as you touch them. So you have two options here. You risk touching the wrong one or you don't play at all, right? You'd say that if I'm going to risk getting caught, you know what, I'm just going to play it smart. I'm not going to play the game at all. The game stacked against me. Now, no self-respecting attacker is usually going to go for that because there's a reason they broke it. There is a certain target they have that they want to achieve. So it kind of becomes a situation where if they don't attack, we as defenders win because they haven't, even though they've broken in, they really haven't been able to cause any damage or any impact. That's a win for us. Or if they attack and they touch the wrong one, that gets them detected, which is much more likely than not. That again, works out in our defense. Now, let's say I take away some of my traditional defenses, right? The problem for the attacker still remains the same. So this, is, this really helps to highlight the fact that deception can kind of uh, augment independently the rest of the security infrastructure that exists. And consider that even the attacker still has the same problem, right? It's basic game theory 101 that you give them two choices and either of which they pick are choices I like. Either they don't attack, in which case nothing's harmed, 
And if they do attack and they get caught, I'm still happy because I'm able to kick their rock out of my network, particularly if I can orchestrate some of the more uh, common attacks, uh, defense against the most common attacks, sorry to say. Uh, and even if uh, I do point out to you that that one is the real one, notice that there's probably a couple of, other, at least one uh, other decoy you're going to hit on the way that you're going to stumble across and it's going to look more valuable to you. Now, the reason we do this is there are a few underlying uh, reasons. And one is that attacker tools and tactics change all the time. Um, anybody who's familiar with the show will know that each of these uh, characters has different ways of uh, getting what they want, getting to their goal. And the same thing goes for attackers. Just because a certain uh, set of tools is known, has a known set of signatures, has a known set of command and control servers and so on, does not mean that that is something we can reliably count on. There have been instances in the past where I think it was, uh, I'm not sure which conference it was, it was uh, RSA or one of the larger ones, I think in the second half of 2017, where, uh, you know, so, uh, where there was a vendor who famously put up banners that said, we stop Mimikatz, which actually is a commendable uh, achievement because it's really, Mimikatz is notoriously difficult to stop. So rightfully, they, you know, they put it up for bragging rights. But uh, less than 48 hours later, there was a patch out by Gentle Kiwi, the author of Mimikatz, that not just bypassed uh, the detections, but also had an option to just, you know, uh, you can go look this up on Twitter, just to add insult to injury, just for fun. We could also go and optionally stop that agent. And one of the competitors then says, like, look, we stopped this new patch version of Mimikatz, we stopped the old one without any changes. So obviously, you know, we're better than our competitors. Well, what do you know? You know, another few days later, and there's another patch version of Mimikatz out, which can't be detected by this competitor's tool either. So if we, did, if we rely on detecting what the attacker has done, we are by definition one step behind. The attacker is a step ahead of us because we're waiting for the attacker to make the first move. If, on the other hand, we can detect something that uh, is the outcome of the attack, irrespective of how you do it, that outcome is something you as an attacker rely on. If we can detect that, then that really makes for much more capable defense. For example, if you want to steal data from a machine, no matter how you do it, you know, whether you're an amateur who just directly connects to the machine or whether you're a really skilled attacker who hops through seven proxies and so on, you must connect to the machine at the end of the day if you want to steal data from a machine. Similarly, short of actually unplugging a hard disk from a machine, uh, if you want to access files on the file system, you must connect, you must touch that file somehow if you want data from that file. Whether you do that by clicking in Explorer or whether you do that by exfiltrating it and opening it offline in a sandbox environment, it kind of really doesn't matter because you must touch the file. If you can detect the fact that you've touched the file, it kind of doesn't matter what tools you use. Uh, we can detect that outcome. We're not using what happened, uh, uh, not detecting how something was uh, done to detect what happened. If we can detect what happened, then we can work our way back to uh, how it was done. Another concept worth keeping in mind is the pyramid of pain. The further up this pyramid you go, the more trouble you cause the attacker. And that is something that we really want to uh, achieve with. Uh, there's this famous children's joke where, you know, there's two folks camping in the woods and a bear attacks. And the two of them start running. One of them says to the other that, you know, we better uh, outrun this bear or we're done for. And the second friend turns around and says, you know, probably not a great friend, but turns around and says that, well, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. That also applies to uh, enterprise security, where if you're enough of a pain to attack, to an attacker, it stops becoming worth their while. If there is somebody who is comparable to you, who has weaker security, who's easier to attack, then you kind of don't become worth attacking anymore. It's standard you know, cost-benefit analysis for the attacker too. So how do we cause the attacker pain? Well, you'll see that on this pyramid, uh, most of your IOCs fall in the bottom four. Uh, and especially the bottom three are really no, uh, no challenge to bypass. Uh, for hash values, even if I've got a multi-petabyte file and you've got a hash value for it, I change one byte and suddenly hash values are useless because a single byte is going to change the hash value of that file. So hash values are only uh, did, uh, effective against really uh, basic attackers, really novice attackers. Uh, they will help you pick up uh, commodity malware and commodity attacks, but they're not really useful against more skilled attackers. Similar thing with IP addresses, you know, the, like with a little effort, there's probably three, four ways people can change the IP addresses on their phones within a minute, let alone on a machine that's dedicated for attacks, but, uh, might even have uh, a botnet with command and control behind it. So an IP address also becomes not a really particularly effective uh, uh, detection mechanism against an attacker. 
and domain names while they're a little more difficult they are uh, they are still not too dif- uh, they are still not too difficult because you can have uh, something called a domain generation algorithm uh, which most malware these days does have and uh, you know it can generate i mean depending on how well the attacker prefers to set it up you can generate thousands of domain names a day and the malware will try to connect to all of them but the attacker behind the scenes just needs to register one domain at the right time and have the malware connect and get orders whereas we on the defensive side need to monitor all of the possible domains for any possible connection so the deck is again kind of stacked against us uh when we actually start causing the attack or some trouble is the network and host artifacts right you can think of this as essentially analogous to the footprints you leave behind in the course of your attack now if you're uh, in the physical world if you're kind of walking through maybe performing some sort of attack if you need to also wipe your footprints uh, behind you in the course of that attack sure it's doable but it's going to slow you down it's going to make your life annoying and difficult a little bit this is uh, where you usually find the most uh, uh effective iocs you know something like uh, certain kinds of network traffic that uh, an attack uh, uh, an attack uses or certain kinds of registry keys that are modified and so on those would usually fall in this bucket moving up to tools this is where you finally really start causing the attacker some difficulty not just in terms of slowing them down where uh, you're actually making them actively put in a lot more effort to have a successful attack so uh, an analogy to this would be you know anybody in the defensive side has uh, used excel analyze csvs and excel files quite a bit now imagine tomorrow if you were told that you know what our office licenses run out we are not renewing it you've got to work with open office or libre office i'm sure you could still achieve what you need to achieve but most folks who are used to uh, working with excel they'll be slowed down they it would take them a lot more effort uh, and time to achieve the same results that they used to in a certain amount of time with excel something that used to probably take you an hour is probably going to take you most of a day uh in 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 a tool you're not familiar with if you can identify the tools an attacker is using even if they kind of uh, take the trouble to wipe the logs behind them and so on if you can detect instances of certain tools being used then you can essentially force the attacker to go on to their version of libreoffice or open office now what you're doing here is you're not stopping an attacker dead in their tracks just like you could achieve your goal with you know alternative software so could an attacker but attackers have certain tools they're much more familiar with you know certain tools they know the the right command line arguments to pass on the right flags to use the right uh, parameters to run it uh, to run it within the constraints of so sure they could fall back to another tool but it's going to be a tool they're less competent with as compared to their preferred tool so you actually start making things challenging for them now everything we've spoken about so far has been technical identifiers right it's uh, either hash values or ip addresses or even the tools that the attacker uses and on the other hand right at the top of the pyramid are ttps tactics techniques and procedures if we can start identifying these we identify some human aspects of the attacker's engagement and then it doesn't matter if the attacker changes all of the technical attributes and the lower parts of the pyramid we can still detect that it's the same attacker for example if you have let's say uh, you detected an attacker that generally goes after like in the example i was saying earlier uh compromises a bunch of uh, non technical folks because you know maybe they think it's easier to compromise them from there they pivot to the it segment from there they elevate privileges to one of, to be one of the admins from there they then pivot to whatever server or domain control they want to target now tomorrow even if uh, an attacker is quite skilled and doesn't use uh, anything with known hash values doesn't connect to known ip addresses or domain names doesn't have any of the same artifacts they're leaving behind and is using entirely different tools if you are observing your logs and uh once you've got a lot of the commodity stuff automated and out of the way when you have the human team members actually analyzing the attack that's happening and they see like hang on a second i see this attack having started in the hr segment it's now gone on to the id segment and i see some uh, privileging escalated now at that point you know already that uh, i have spotted this kind of behavior in the past and i know what they were going after so even though none of the technical parameters match what i have seen previously the behavioral parameters do match and this becomes a lot more difficult because there are aspects of human behavior that we don't spot ourselves uh, aspects of our own behavior so it becomes a lot more difficult a lot less likely even that an attacker will be able to spot it and change that uh, that's essentially what we want to cause uh, that's what we want to detect to cause the attacker a lot more pain because once we identify this we can preemptively go and uh, defend the resource that the attacker had previously gone after the attacker with these ctps and even though we don't know how you're getting there 
we can, for example, set up additional defenses in front of that, uh, in front of the right server or domain controller, maybe step up our logging to monitor for any suspicious activity and so on. Basically, you want to give your attack, uh, your enemy a chance to make a mistake and not interrupt them, right? Uh, this, uh, this image you see here is, uh, is, a, is a famous one from uh, World War II, where uh, any World War II history buffs would probably know this. The Normandy landings were famously faked. Uh, they basically set up these inflatable tanks so that uh, Hitler's aerial surveillance would think that the attack, the attack was happening at a different port uh, in France called Calais. And uh, even when Hitler's aerial surveillance did go over the place, they saw you know, what they thought were legitimate tanks. Uh, which were actually just inflatable tanks they'd set up. They, they actually had some actual soldiers there too, just to kind of add icing on the cake. Uh, Hitler set up his defenses for uh, Calais and the, uh, the, the uh, Allied powers were able to attack from Normandy. That's essentially what you want to do on your network too. You want to set it up so that the attacker is constantly wasting their time on things that they shouldn't really be spending their time on. If they were to successfully accomplish their goal, to achieve what they're looking for, but uh, you're stacking the deck enough against them that they don't really have a choice far as they know they are actually engaging with a legitimate target. So just to kind of pull it all together, uh, if, if you want to apply adversarial thinking, uh, we need to kind of think, uh, start thinking in terms of uh, graphs and not lists. Uh, we also need to ensure that uh, we speak the language of the attacker. If if you get a sense of uh, how attackers communicate, how they achieve what they achieve, you're, you're much more able to do a, a better job at defense. This goes back to their adversarial thinking equation earlier. I'll, I'll touch on that again in a minute. Uh, you, you need to break the attackers would loop complete yours before they do. Uh, that's as long as you can outpace them, uh, whether that be by speeding yourself up or by swing them down or through some combination of the two, you can uh, cause them a fair bit of uh, inconvenience, slow them down, and uh, essentially outpace them, break the loop and win. Uh, like I was talking about, the equation to keep in mind simple enough, where uh, if you can combine red teaming, where you'll have uh, folks on uh, who are assisting the defensive teams, but who are actually uh, performing uh, offensive exercises, combine that with deception and threat hunting and a capable incident response platform, uh, you can essentially really make it uh, much less worth the attacker's while and make it so that the attacker maybe, maybe th even thinks twice about attacking you. Maybe you're not even worth uh, being their target anymore. Uh, additionally, if you can set up a good threat hunting uh, uh, practice, you can uh, significantly reduce dwell time. Attackers can usually linger in the environment. Now, obviously, every analyst has their own numbers for you know how long this dwell time is. For somebody, it's 90 days. For somebody, it's a year and a half. Uh, I think the last report I read has been a while. It's a uh, Mandiant's report from last year. said that in Asia Pacific, it was about a year and a half. So I think some 490 days between an attacker breaking in and actually uh, completing their attack. So if you can cut that down before they complete their attack, before they actually achieve their goal, you can stop them. Breaking in is as much as we don't like it, it does not achieve for the attacker what they're seeking to achieve. So we can prevent them from getting to their goal. Um, basic game theory, like I was talking about, set the attacker up so that they must take two choices, both of which you like. Uh, you can essentially break their OODA loop. And you can, if you can find out what happened and then work back to how it was done, as opposed to uh, using detections that say, only if I know this is bad, uh, then I will flag it as malicious, where that was one of the reasons, you know, tr uh, uh, traditional signature-based antivirus has kind of uh, been a lot more phased out these days because it would use uh, how something is being done. How is this file different from others? Okay, it matches the signature to figure out what happened. That means if I can't figure out how, I essentially say it's, it's all right, it must be good, which isn't really an effective uh, defense approach in these days. Whereas if you can figure out that something is happening, even if you don't quite understand how, when you know something's happening, you can kind of direct your effort to figuring out how it was done and not work the other way around. Um, so in sum, that's the single greatest change you can make to your security, even without any tool. If you can start thinking about uh, some of these uh, concepts, uh, start trying to apply this kind of strategy uh, to your uh, defenses. If you can start trying to think adversarially, you can actually make it a lot more capable uh, uh, a defense that you're that you're exercising in your organization. 
Uh, I'll just, just before I dive into the demo, I'm going to take a couple of quick questions. Uh, Mohammed has asked uh, in the Q&A, uh, uh, does deception learn the network infra automatically and how effective is uh, deception detection in cloud infrastructure? Uh, now, whether it turns it automatically actually varies from tool to tool. The way we do it, we do have something called Mirage Maker, which, you know, the name is fairly straightforward. It makes something that is fake, but looks real. It's going to study the environment and see, okay, I see a bunch of Dell servers around me. So maybe I should also pretend to be a Dell server, right? Uh, I see that um, the, the, there are a bunch of file shares and a bunch of web applications here and uh, one database. I should have a similar setup for my deception and maybe just uh, to have something that looks worth uh, targeting, I'll have one machine that looks different. You know, maybe you have a bunch of Dell blades, I'm going to run an HP server instead, and I'm going to set it up with uh, something like a Linux uh, SSH prompt. Um, and for uh, cloud infrastructure, you can deploy it similarly to the way you do on-prem infrastructure, where uh, uh, the, it's a little bit uh, different in terms of technical prerequisites, but uh, conceptually it's the same. It's, it's a remote network. Uh, so we need to deploy the decoys remotely, but uh, that can technically be done. We've got that running in quite a few organizations. Uh, Webhub had another question that says, uh, how does one deal with deception uh, and uh, with deception cache and fatigue that may creep in after a chain of pseudo attacks launched by the adversary? Have you come across such a situation in the past? That's actually a fantastic question because you know, what if the adversary tries to set up deception against us, right? Uh, this is where uh, a lot of the orchestration would help. If you've got a lot of your defensive approaches automated, then uh, you can afford to spend time on some of these alerts. Even if the attacker is trying to psych you out, you can find out where that uh, fake attack is coming from. Forget what they're attacking. Figure out where the attack is coming from. Uh, that machine is definitely compromised. Even if it's being used to run pseudo attacks, that, that machine is definitely something someone else has control of, and I don't want that. And that's where I will, uh, from that OODA loop earlier, I will orient myself towards that machine and remediate right there. So then I don't care about uh, whether your, your attack is, uh, you know, a pseudo attack or a, a real one. I can just shut down anything that, any activity that you're doing whatsoever. And uh, uh, we haven't come across this so much in, in the wild, but uh, like I was talking about earlier, our uh, red and blue teams, we do a fair bit of research internally. We have tried this out. So that's why I was saying that it's actually not a very common question. Definitely a good question, Weber. Uh, and uh, once he's made a note of uh, looking at the MITRE attack framework, that's actually something I'm gonna touch on in the demo that I'm gonna to get to in a minute. Uh, how to pick up an area of the attack framework and to start threat hunting. All right, that, uh, that actually gets me right into the demo quite well. Let me just uh, pull up my dashboard. Right, uh, so this is our platform. We've got, uh, okay, my network looks good. Uh, this is usually, uh, you know, what you might see with a, uh, with a slight bit of activity. In a perfect world, you know, because you have decoys, nobody ever interacts with any of the deceptive assets. In a perfect world, this is what it looks like. You've got nothing on the dashboard. Uh, because if you're a, a database admin, for example, you know which databases you need to administer. You're not poking around at random databases on your infrastructure and saying, hey, can I administer this too? Right? You've, you've got a sense of which machines you need to work with. Uh, similarly, you, uh, you know, if, if I place some fake files on your machine, you're not enumerating your entire file system all the time, especially if I tell you this file is a decoy, it's serving no legitimate function in your day-to-day -day work. So you have no real reason to interact with it. Whereas to an attacker, if I can make it look like, you know, I've got a hidden passwords file, then, well, it's a passwords file, it's hidden, so it must be valuable. Uh, on the other hand, I could also have something like a confidential agreement, and you're never really going to use that agreement because you know it's a fake one with fake information in it, but to an attacker, that might as well be real, right? Uh, if if you lie on your network, we, once we break in as attackers, we don't really have a sense of what's what right away. It takes us some time. So if you lie, we we'll believe you because as long as it looks like it's something that uh, you know is told to the rest of the of the team too, we're going to believe it because we're going to be like, look, you wouldn't lie to yourself, would you? So uh, let's talk about uh, a couple of ways we can actually carry out uh, some of these attacks. We can set up some uh, public-facing uh, decoys where uh, just internal decoys, but we can set up unlisted subdomains. So let me just see if I can uh, run a quick uh, brute force. Uh, let me just see, I think I've lost my window there. All right, there we go. Yep. 
Yeah. Multi monitor setups never quite worked the way you want them, right? So I've set up a, uh, essentially a fake company here called Actus Ventures. Uh, I'm, I've got my uh, DNS recon tool saying, you know, just go search for the domain, uh, run this tool against the domain ActusVentures.com. Uh, the type of attack I want you to run is a brute force attack. And the uh, dictionary I want you to use for this attack is uh, this uh, subdomains uh, text file. Now, just to give you a sense of uh, what's in that text file, let me just uh, open that up. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, so this file is just a simple uh, list of uh, subdomains that might might exist for any organizations. So what this script is going to do is going to take, it's going to go look for www.optusventures.com, see if it exists. It's going to look for mail.optusventures.com, see if it exists. It's going to look for FTP and you get the idea. So that's basically what I'm going to tell the script to do at this point. And uh, parallelly, I'm not really running it right now because that could take a little while. Uh, you could have it, you could have a crawler that goes and crawls the entire website and says, uh, you know, just find every subdomain that's linked to on the website. Now, let's say I find 10 subdomains on your website that have been linked to from your various pages. And I find, uh, you know, 11 or 12 of them on my DNS recon. That delta of two or, uh, of one or two tells me that uh, these, you've gone through the trouble of making sure these subdomains exist. They exist in your DNS, but you're not linking to them anywhere. That means anybody who needs to access them already knows where they are. Right, they're not going to get through it by clicking, but they might be, you know, employees or contractors who know that they're supposed to type that email uh, .octusventures.com to get to their mail server, or they're supposed to type vpn.octusventures.com to get to their uh, uh, VPN server, and so on. Whereas I don't really need to li link the rest of the world to that. So we see a couple of results beginning to come through now. Let's just see if. Uh, we can access vpn.octusventures.com. And sure enough, I've got uh, a VPN login page. Let me just uh, uh, maximize this a bit so that uh, folks at home can see what's going on. Um, I'm essentially going to log in as admin. Now, uh, in this case, you can even have your own virtual keyboard set up, you know, so you can type in uh, whatever password you have that matches your policy or something of that sort. Now, this can be as in-depth or as basic as we'd like. Even if nobody logs in, even if they just load the page, that tells me that the attacker has gone, you know, probably brute force my DNS. Now, regular users at home visiting a website don't have any reason to brute force your DNS, right? So that automatically becomes suspicious. The, this automatically raises a flag that why is this person doing what they're doing? And I can attempt to log in. My login fails. I can have this go into a few steps of depth if I would like. Uh, I haven't really bothered setting up, uh, start setting that up in this demo, but you could really have it go as detailed as you'd like. And you can see that our activity has been detected. And again, in a perfect world, nobody interacts with any decoy ever. Let me just zoom in so that uh, folks at home can get a clear view of that. Now, uh, as you can see, I'm coming from an MTNL connection. Now, if we click on this attack and see what activity was done, this is where we get something we, we like to call thread parse. Uh, let me just, I'll just reload my page after turning this up a bit. So the folks at home can actually get a better visual of what's going on. I'm just gonna give this another few seconds to load. Uh, sure enough, right? Uh, the demagogues don't like me. When something's supposed to work, that's the one time it won't. All right, there we go. We have our dashboard loaded. So now when I click on Sataka and I want to see what you're up to, or I want to see what happened on my uh, threat intelligence uh, decoys, I, threat pass tells me the same way I communicate with the rest of my team, right? When you're talking to your team, uh, you're not usually saying stuff like uh, TCP port 80 sin synac act. Uh, HTTP 1.1 get index.html, you're not saying stuff like this. That's what, but usually those are the logs you're dealing with, right? So threat pass is basically gonna tell you in plain English, hey, that was an attempted login. Now, if you want the technical details, you can go through, uh, you can actually correlate this quite well with the rest of the infrastructure through your SIM or through a sort platform, but it's gonna give you a quick introduction of what happened. 
and you can see the credentials that have been dumped in. Now, all of this is going to your SIM. And what you can do is then you can see whether the same user also from the same IP, were there any access attempts to my legitimate infrastructure? Uh, was this user actually logged in at around this time on any of my legitimate uh, actual infrastructure? Is this password valid? Then I probably want to reset the credentials. This is some of the stuff we can automate that if somebody ever logs into a decoy uh, on the public facing decoys with a valid password, automatically reset the user sessions, change their password, uh, you know, just uh, reset their password, force them to set a new one and enable two-factor authentication if available. Also send an email to the stock, send an email to the user uh, and uh, check for any active sessions on legitimate infrastructure and terminate those. Uh, and you can tell your firewall parallelly to block this source. So you can really piece that together quite well. Another thing we could do is, uh, I'm just gonna pop over, let's say this is a compromised machine that I have managed to get control of within Arctis Ventures. Uh, I'm gonna try something simple enough where I'm just gonna look for interesting files on this machine. Let me just turn up the font once again. Well, there we go. So I'm, I'm just going to run a basic script that's going to say find interesting files to the folks uh, at home who are familiar with PowerView. I'm, that's basically what I'm using here. I'm going to tell it to find interesting files on this machine. Uh, sure enough, it finds important docs on the desktop, uh, the important docs folder. Now, even though that folder is hidden from the user, my tool kind of doesn't really care what the user is saying, right? It's querying the file system directly. So I could just... Uh, change my directory to important docs. As an attacker, let's say I want to exfiltrate this password file. And uh, I could just say, I mean, right now I'm gonna copy it locally, but I could copy it to, uh, uh, right now I'm gonna copy locally to passwords underscore one dot XLSX, but this could uh, just as well be a remote uh, server that I have. I'm exfiltrating data to, I suspect that you have deception deployed. So I'm going to, you know, play it safe. I'm gonna open this file offline. And even just for safe measure, I'm going to open it in a sandbox just in case, I'm going to monitor what activity it has. Um, and sure enough, I've got the passwords file uh, exfiltrated. In fact, if I just quickly open up uh, Explorer and uh, show my hidden files, on my desktop, I'm going to see that important uh, docs file. I'm going to see that the exfiltration was successful. On the other hand, even though there was a uh, uh, there's nothing to indicate to the attacker that their activity was detected. We can detect it. And all of this doesn't require an agent because um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a fair number of you have already heard that, uh, uh, heard of uh, what's called uh, LOL, right? Living off the land. Uh, that's something attackers like to do, misuse built-in Windows components to, uh, to perform attacks because an attacker is basically a sysadmin with malicious intent, right? Uh, if attackers can live off the land, why can't we? So that's basically what we do. We use built-in Windows utilities to tell us, hey, if anyone accesses this file, tell Smokescreen. And then Smokescreen, of course, forwards it to uh, NIF and other uh, controls you have in your environment as you set it up. And if we say what file theft activity was uh, has occurred, we can see that file decoy interaction was uh, attempted. And we can also see that you know somebody attempted to access my passwords file with uh, PowerShell.exe. Now, I don't know about how your environment is run, but my environment generally office files are open with office, you know, not with PowerShell. So this becomes a very high, uh, high fidelity alert to tell me that something's going wrong. And also because attackers generally have a goal of causing some sort of data theft or manipulation. If they're interacting with my decoy files, they're probably also rifling through my real files. And that tells me that the attacker is probably close to completing at least some portion of their attack. This is an alert we get so rarely that, you know, we actually have some clients who've who have set up automated orchestrated actions that say, if a if file theft is detected, just automatically tell my NAC uh, through my SOAR platform to quarantine that machine. And uh, if a network admin, for example, accidentally uh, opened that file, they knock themselves on the network as a result, you know, they'll contact me and I'll get them back on the network within a few minutes. Uh, I would much rather take that risk than taking the risk of someone exfiltrating data and me not acting on it just because, you know, uh, my team was swamped with something else. Like with the, with the target breach, uh, they had good tech, they had FireEye that detected uh, a lot of those alerts. I forget, it was somewhere between five and 10 alerts of their malware.binary field. But uh, because those alerts were not acted on, the attack was able to be completed successfully. Whereas we can uh, prevent something like that from happening just through pure orchestration, where even if this happens at midnight on Sunday, 
we don't really mind because we've got our uh, response uh, orchestrated. And uh, just as a final part of the demo, let's say, you know, uh, I'm going to be smart about it. I could uh, run a network scan, but that'll be noisy. I want to be stealthy, so I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm only going to interact with the uh, assets that uh, this user, um, as you can see here, uh, the user Eric here interacts with. Let's just turn up the font on this one too. Yep, uh, I'm going to look at the resources that Eric interacts with and only interact with those resources so that even though I suspect you have deception, I don't hit any of your deception, right? So I've got a tool on my desktop called uh, Lasagna. Uh, I'm going to tell it, so I can tell it to dump my my saved browser passwords. I can tell it to dump uh, credential manager passwords. I'm just going to tell it to dump everything it can find. And sure enough, it uh, finds a bunch of saved entries. It finds passwords in my world. It finds my credential manager passwords. Uh, it's found passwords in Chrome. So think about this. When's the last time uh, you might have uh, seen your browser pop up and say, hey, do you want to save this password? For those of you that use password managers, same thing, right? Uh, you might have accidentally clicked save when you typed in the wrong password, then you go and correct it. Everyone's been through that once or twice. But when's the last time you purposely saved the wrong password in your password manager? Nobody ever does that. So what that to an attacker says that if I can find your password manager, I can trust it like gospel. Anything I find in your password manager, nobody lies in their own password manager. So anything I find in there, I can believe. So I can actually believe that Eric uses this password on the SAP server. He uses this password on uh, his SAP backup server and so on. So let's actually try to access something that Eric works with day to day. Uh, this, this tells me that either this is something Eric accesses frequently. That's why he just wants to say the password to avoid the hassle of having to log in again and again. Or it's something he accesses infrequently, but uh, you know, can't afford to forget the password off because it's so valuable. I still want to know what that is. Uh, you can set up your own uh, certificates. You can actually uh, feed in your own certificates onto the uh, decoy web servers as well. So I'm going to log in as Eric using the password I found. Now, once I log into this password, once again, in this case, I've just set up a basic demo where it just refreshes the login page, but you could actually have it say, you know, wrong password, please contact admin or something of that sort. And sure enough, I see that activity coming through in real time on the dashboard, right? So we've, we essentially cut our detection time down from, you know, hours, weeks, months, uh, depending on the various stats you believe, uh, to seconds. Uh, and you can see that there was an attempted web login. And if I check what uh, credentials we used to log in, I see that this is the password. Now, this password, Smokescreen left behind purposely as a fake password in the password manager for the attacker to find. So tomorrow, even if this password comes from one of the other machines, I've got another user called Felix set up in my environment. So if uh, even if that is uh, accessed from Felix's machine, uh, the fact that Eric's username and this password was used tells me that the attacker was on Eric's machine and has access to Chrome uh, SQLite DB that stores the passwords at some point. So I can go through my logs and look for those specific selectors. And instead of having a thousand like log lines to look through, I can uh, look through you know just maybe a few tens. And that really cuts down my time to analyze, even in the cases when I can't automate it, when I really need to do manual analysis for something like this that deserves manual attention, I can cut down the amount of time it takes me to analyze. And all of this, of course, is being uh, sent to the rest of your orchestration platforms. And you can, you can even set up rules where you can say, uh, when, when something is, uh, uh, when a certain type of activity occurs, you can set uh, whatever rules you would like here. So you can say, you know, if uh, my decoy dot, uh, name is admin db or you know whatever you can really i'm just making stuff up at this point but you can get uh, as uh, as complex or as uh, simple as you'd like so you can say you know if the type is uh, let's say i'm only looking for web access then when you get this type of activity i want you to uh, notify certain people and forward it to uh, forward it to net monastery's nif platform and uh, maybe also, if, if you've got NIFS a sword platform, then you can just set it up through there, or else you can uh, set it up through here saying that, you know, send, send this to Cisco Eyes, for example, uh, sorry, uh, or CrowdStrike, and set up policies on that end for what action you want to take when a smoke screen alert comes through. So you can get fairly uh, detailed with this, but uh, I think uh, that's it for the time I have. Uh, just to touch on your point, uh, Bamsi, I'm sorry I missed that point earlier. We're also mapping a lot of this activity we are seeing 
to the appropriate uh, uh, MITRE attack ID so that, well, one, this helps analysts kind of uh, upskill and learn basic, uh, learn various attack types, and it helps uh, uh, security team managers get a sense for where in the matrix they're covered and where their blind spots are. Uh, just to check out uh, if there are any other questions left. Uh, Webhub is also curious about the utility of pseudo attacks, especially carried out for disorienting security efforts and being able to really meaningfully fingerprint the adversary. Uh, uh, the end goal of typical diamond model. Actually, Webhub, that's another good question. I would say that uh, uh, you can, because we're agnostic to what the attacker is doing, we can fingerprint, we, we don't want to fingerprint just their technical uh, parameters, like, you know, what tools they're using or what uh, hash values uh, uh, I can use to detect their tools. Uh, like that pyramid you might remember from earlier, if we can identify the human aspects, if we can go, if we can use a technical fingerprinting as a mechanism to under, understand the human fingerprinting of things, then we can figure out that, uh, figure out aspects of the attacker's methodology that stay true irrespective of the kind of uh, tools or environment they're in, the kind of things they prefer to do. And uh, I think that's it for questions. Um, if any come up, please feel free to uh, uh, feel free to drop them in Q and I'll I'll answer the ones I can. I can also uh, answer them later if we connect uh, offline. Um, I can be reached at uh, the email address in in the slide from earlier. I'm just going to share it once again for those that need it. All right, thanks. That's it from me.